So the, the, the way we process information, the, all the environmental stimuli, is based on the neurons. They, they talk to each other, they process, and uh, they make a decision. There are two, mainly two ways of um, communication. Um, one is the, through the release of neurotransmitters. The other one is, the, I mentioned, through gap junctions. So the basic idea is that we want to develop a new genetically encoded non-invasive method to image the gap junction communication. So it's ba based on the, uh, it's a channel between cells. We want in the one cell, we want to generate a specific small molecule as a mediator. And in the other cell, the, the mediator will go through the gap junction. And in the connected cell, there's a sensor for the small mediator. Mm. So once we trigger one cell, mm -hmm. there's a response in the other cell. Then this demonstrate that these two cells are communicated by gap junctions. That's the basic idea. So, so for now, we know that the main function for electrical synapses is uh, synchronized neurons firing. Like those oh, yeah. neurons are connected by gap junctions, they will fire together. So they will release transmitters together. If you don't know how to code, you, you spend more time on boring stuff and uh, be less efficient. Though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Five, four, three, two, one. Ni hao, everybody. Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site in the beautiful Beijing, China at the Peking University School of Life Sciences. We are now going to be talking about neural communication. We have Dr. Ling Wu joining us on the show. Hi. Hi. Thank, Hi. You, thank you so much for coming on our show. You're really welcome. appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited to talk about Ling's work. For those that don't know, she's a postdoc in the Lee Lab at Peking University School of Life Sciences who developed Paris, an optogenetic method for functionally mapping gap junctions. And you can find the links in the bio below. Ling, let's start things off by asking one of our favorite questions. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? So, yeah, that's a very interesting question. And uh, to be honest, I'm a little bit pessimistic about the future of humans. Why? I, I mean, they, so we, we, we've done too much to the earth on um, like, Someday, someday we will extinct. Mm, like the, the climate, the environment, the, the, the resource. Though we are there, many scientists are working on solving those problems. But still, I a little bit pessimistic. <laughs> but this is fine, it's fine for the Earth for the universe. <laughs> we have a lot of people that come onto the show and tell us that we have a big challenge that we have to arise to. We have climate, we have geopolitical, we have exponential technologies, we have all of these things that are happening at the same time and uh, we need more young people and scientists and artists and inspirational leaders to step up and tackle these big challenges otherwise the human species has big issues that we face. Do you think one of the big reasons why we have all of the issues is because we're disconnected from nature, from what sustains us? Um, what do you mean? Can you? you like, like the air, the food, the water, 
the nature. It sustains us and we're disconnected from it, so that's why we have problems. Do you feel that way? I feel, yeah, sort of. I feel we care, we care not enough about the nature. We're, we're selfish, um, most of us. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> this is a big thing too, is to figure out this, this Nash equilibrium between how much time and resources and energy I invest into myself and my own sustenance and success and how much I invest into the collective, into society, into my family, my community, my country, the world. This balance between those two things, how to harmonize yeah, them. It's, it's a very complicated issue. So I, I don't have a good answer how, how can we solve this problem or, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you bring it up though because it's something that is very close to our hearts and we talk about it a lot on the show. So I'm glad that you have a more realistic idea on the d direction of the world rather than just, you know, naively, you know, optimistic or super pessimistic. It's good to be realistic about how challenging it is. Yeah. Let's talk about your journey. So who were you as a kid growing up? Where were you born? How did you get interested in science? Tell us about your story. Well, I was born as a, the only children in my family and from an Anhui province in the, uh, by the Yangtze River. Mm -hmm. So it's a long, longest uh, river goes across the middle of China. I was born by the side of the river. And uh, I, yeah, since I'm the only, I was the only children and a ch ch child mm -hmm. in the family. I, my memory about the, uh, when I was a child is that um, it's quite lonely and I will, um, Although I will play around, I would play around with other kids, but there more more often I was locked in in the home when my parents was were working. Um, yeah. And then what were your parents doing, and what were you doing that got you interested in science? What were what were your parents doing? They are um, analytic and analysts. Analysts, yeah. Um, about uh, uh, chemicals. Chemical, chemical analysts, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then what were you doing when you were young that got you interested in science? Well, I... I was pretty good at, at math, at... Uh, chemistry and uh, biology when I was in uh, uh, um, middle school and high school. So obviously I chose to become a STEM uh, student yeah. in uh, college. So because I, so uh, maybe it's very uh, typical Chinese student for yeah so because I have the best scores for my biology so I chose the biology and also because I'm interested in the nature yeah I yeah I remember that I I liked a lot that mm, when we have a spring festival spring holiday and the summer holiday my mom will uh, bring me back to my uh, grandparents' place, uh, which, which is located on a, a rural region of the city in the countryside. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love 
the forests, the lakes, uh, yes. the animals. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, okay, so, so scoring really well in biology plus your love for nature got you to actually pursue biotechnology at Anhui University. Yeah. Okay. So now tell us about that. What were you studying when you were there? Um, so it's not really biotechnology. So, <laughs> so it's more that means general. You, you need to change your your bio then, because it says biotechnology. So in the yeah in the certificate it yeah. said bio biotechnology. I mean, it's more general. Mm. I s we we studied yeah plant botany um, animal I mean animal biology I forgot the yeah names. animal biology yeah uh, yeah and the microbiology and microbiology so, okay so there in a, in our university more um, more labs are are doing uh, botany. Mm -hmm. And the microbiology. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we, so by uh, biotechnology, more related to using uh, engineered uh, my micro uh, microbes to yeah. generate products. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Engineering microbes to generate products. Yeah. Yeah. And I did a little bit. Um, plant biology. I went to a lab and uh, was focusing on a um, find out um, best condition to induce the product, a product production of uh, garlic. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's a very useful plant. Uh, we can have uh, products out of it to the of key. garlic. Yeah, of garlic. It's a he healthy food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, makes our breath smell. <laughs> there's yeah. lot. Yeah, there's lots of there's lots of good food with garlic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about the move to Peking University to the School of Life Sciences here after Anhui University. How did that move happen? Yeah, so we I was um, engaged in a summer camp, summer campus um, here in Peking University. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Chinese Academic uh, Institute, and uh, yeah, basically I applied some. S universities as well as institute for the summer um, campus program on um, in my uh, when I was uh, third year third year of, of my college and uh, I came to Beijing uh, the first time <laughs> and uh, yeah I then, then the the program goes like uh, then the, there will be a uh, introduction about different labs, and uh, then you will be able to um, work in the lab shortly for a couple of days if you if you like, and you can talk to the PI of the lab, and that's when I met Yulong. Mm -hmm. So. When I, the first time I met him, it's really like uh, he was still like a college student. <laughs> yeah, that's when he just got back from US, mm -hmm. just started his lab. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that he is, uh, he was a PI already. So I thought he, he is a, student, college student. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, then he, he was very enthusiastic talking to the new, new uh, students because, yeah, one reason is because he, he wants to 
recruit student to his lab. So then we have a talk. We had a talk, and uh, and uh, I found th by that time I was I was r already interested in uh, neuroscience. Okay. Because. I think neurons are very unique yeah. cells. Like you can talk to them, like you can stimulate them. They were firing mm -hmm. a potential. And uh, that time, I was interested in uh, uh, electrophysiology. I I did a rotation in a lab, and also in Peking University, only for a uh, one week. They were there are new um, lab using electrophysiology recording to uh, study uh, neuro neural functions and also uh, degenerative disease mm -hmm. diseases and uh, and Yulong kept showing up in the main hall in the building every day and every day he will we, we can catch up him and we will have a talk, we would have a talk, and uh, we talked a lot, and uh, he was an electrophysiologist, and, uh, but he wants to do uh, e imaging, mm -hmm. his new lab. And I think it's, it's also very interesting. Yeah, imaging, bec I, I like, I like things like um, you can you can have the results or the readouts immediately. Yeah. Imaging like it's very um, instant real gratification. Time. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> real time is a yeah, readout. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Right. It's be very beautiful. So, so I I joined the lab. And you, it was really, you, you got interested in neuroscience and you wanted to, like you really liked being able to stimulate a neuron and see action potential happen. You saw uh, also this interest in being able to map neural activity. You wanted to be a part of, of doing that and see this immediate, immediate map, the immediate results of being able to map something. So, and the combination of, of course, you coming here right around the time that Yulong was starting the lab and stuff. So what about how you picked what you were interested in doing at the lab out of everything in neuroscience? So I, yeah, the lab is more focused on uh, techno te technology, techniques, developing new techniques. And uh, the, the topic I chose was about um, relatively underestimated field about elect uh, about gap junctions or electrical synapses. So neurons will talk to each other. So the the, the way we process informations, the all the environmental stimuli, is based on the neurons. They they talk to each other, they process and uh, they make a decision. So there are two, mainly two ways of um, communication. Um, one is the, through the release of neurotransmitters. The other one is, the, I mentioned, through gap junctions. Which both happen in the synapse, both neurotransmission and electrical. Yeah, they, they, can, ha they can happen both at the same synapses, or um, gap junction is more broad. They can happen between not only uh, the chemical synapse. So the chemical synapse can be a mixed synapse with neurotransmitter release, mm -hmm. as well as the channel. So, wow. but- Wow, how do you know if a synapse is both for neurochemical and for electrical, or if it's just for electrical, how do you how do you know that? You can uh, you can use uh, electrophysiology recording. 
So mm. imagine that it's a two cells. Okay. The two, two cells, um, if you depolarize one cell, you stimulate one cell, you can record at, if, it, if it's a um, excitatory cell, mm. yeah. <laughs> so you yeah. stimulate one cell and you record the post-synaptic cell, yes. it will give you an action potential if the presynaptic cell is an excitatory cell. Yes. And if you block the chemical synaptic cells, block the neurotransmitter release, uh, you can still record a signal. And that's that the electrical, that means yeah. that that has electrical, can yeah. have a neuroelectrical communication. Yes. Not just neurochemical. Okay. Yeah. Or, yeah, okay. So, out of, do we know out of all of the neurons in the brain, do we know how many of the connections, like what percentage of them are both neurochemical and neuroelectrical versus just neurochemical? Do we have any idea? Mm, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. So yeah, that's the okay. reason Damn. We, need, <laughs> Damn. we need new technologies. But some are just neurochemical and some are both neurochemical, neuroelectrical, and some are just neuroelectrical. So you have three, either chemical, electrical, or both. Is that right or no? I think, I think they, they, they probably there are no cells just uh, electric communicate with just electrical. Just electrical, okay. Yeah. So it's either both or just neurochemical? Or, yeah, or they talk through different ways, so it's such as there's three cells, three cells, for okay. example, there's three cells. Okay. These two only talk through gap junction, electrical synapse. Oh, These wow. two talk through uh, chemical synapse. Wow. But for this cell, you have both uh, electrical and the chemical communication. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. How many, how many total can be at a, um, at a synapse? Can you have, how many s nerves can be pointed at the same synapse? Uh, sorry. You were giving this example of three, right? Yeah. Yeah, three neurons in the same synapse. Yeah. Um, it kind of it's kind, it doesn't have to be the same synapse. The neuron can have a lot of synapses. Yes, yes. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of streets. Because, <laughs> you know, if you have the streets like this, this can look like four neurons, you know, with a synapse in the middle, right? And if it's maybe only, you know, wait, I, I don't know if I can make th three. So this, so this is two, and then, you know, maybe this is like three, right? Something like that. But this is going that way, and this, but then, like, I'm wondering, could there be five or six? Yeah, uh, one neuron can talk to many, many. Yeah, yeah one neuron's neurons. connected to like a thousand or something, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, something ridiculously high. Yeah. But, but then, that, but, but out of, out of one synapse, one, one space, that synapse can be for two neurons, or it can be for three, or four, or, no? I think for one, just one synapse, yeah. perhaps it's only a uni, uni uh, oh, you, you, mono. Oh, unidirectional or yeah. monodirectional. One way. Yeah. Oh, okay. It happens ra rarely that maybe there, in some cases, there are maybe more than two neurons, uh, more than one neurons Cause connected to. Okay, because you gave the example of three. But uh, I mean, different synapses, different part of the neuron. Or if they, the, the chemical released, for, for the chemical synapses, the released neurotransmitter can propagate, can um, travel long di distance if they're stable. They can, you know, along the way, they can uh, talk to many neurons, other cells. Okay. This is already so interestingly cool and fascinating. So, okay, what is, so what's the, you, you called a, um, an electrical synapse is a gap junction. 
Yes. And a normal or traditional synapse is where neurotransmission can occur that is neurochemical, which is like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Okay. So, in a, so we're still trying to figure out how many are traditional synapses versus also ele electrical synapses. And your specific study is on electrical synapses, gap junctions. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is so. But you have a you have a nice visual of this, and we can embed the visual here. But you have a you have a uh, a you have a presynaptic side, and you have a postsynaptic side. And here's the synapse. What are what are these called again at the ends? This is dendrites. The uh, the ones a den. Axon, this is dendrite. So Presynapse, the axon, yes. yes. Presynaptic is axon. Yeah. Postsynaptic is dendrite. Yeah. Okay. Axon, synapse, dendrite. Okay. Axon terminal is. Oh, axon, axon terminal, terminal and the ah, dendrite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These two membrane consist consist a synapse. The structure yes. consists synapse. Okay. Yeah. Axon and then axon terminal and then synapse, and then dendrite here on the other side, yes. Yeah. Okay, and then on the axon terminal is super complicated stuff that I have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's where the <laughs> neurotransmitter release. It's where the neurotransmitter release, but there's like vesicles, right? Yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, so, and the vesicles, they already have the, the neurochemicals in them? Yeah. And the neuron picks which one to release out of the vesicle? There are a bunch of vesicles docking on the presynaptic region. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, they're potential sensitive, calcium sensitive, and yeah, if you stimulate the, the neuron will firing and uh, the Calcium will influx. Well, a calcium will goes into the cell and uh, trigger the membrane fusion of the vesicle. So they will. Whoa. Yeah. Release all together. Whoa. And is in the vesicles different neurochemicals ready to go, and then the neuron picks which one it wants to. They, lose? at the once, um, terminal. Most of the time is. Um, just one type of chemicals. So all the vesicles contain the same oh. type of uh, transmitter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And a, a different axon terminal, but same neuron is different neurochemicals? That's a very interesting question. And I think we don't, right now we don't have a clear answer to that. And uh, that's why uh, the method our lab developed is very useful. If you check out other episodes <laughs> of yours, yeah, about the neurotransmitter sensors. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there are peptide neurotransmitters and uh, uh, small chemical neurotransmitters. They can happen, they can be synthesized in the same neuron, like for, for this neuron. Let's, let's say the uh, dopamine neuron, they can not only release dopamine, but also GABA. Yeah. And for other neurons, they can also, uh, they can release GABA and uh, neuropeptide. Okay. So, but how do different type of uh, modulators in one cell being controlled to release? Yes. It's interesting. It's and, so uh, interesting. <laughs> not clear yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the neuron has some sort of, of, of modulation mechanism inside of it that, d that based on what's happening in the environment as it gets stimulated picks which neurochemical or neuroelectrical signals to pass on through its axon terminals to other neurons. Yeah, this is crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> different type of stimulation, different state of your brain. Like some can happen very soon, some can uh, is a 
a chronic effect. Then, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay, so let's talk about then, uh, you picked uh, electrical synapses. Mm -hmm. um, why did you pick electrical synapses versus studying neurochemical transmission? So the rationale it was very simple. I chose to study something less people study. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's very good, yes. <laughs> Walk down the and path that there's less people walking down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Less, yeah. More scientific discovery potential, potentially, who knows, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, Con so continue. That was the decision, but then how do you, you know, you start with, okay, so I've picked electrical synapses, now what the heck do I do? How do I even come up with something like Paris, like, you know? Yeah, so... They're relatively, so right now, or before this uh, strategy uh, developed, there are not too many, or ev almost none of the um, methods to investigate, investigate gap junctions, which are non-invasive or genetically encoded. So we want them. So the basic idea is that we want to develop a new genetically encoded non-invasive method to um, image the gap junction communication. By uh, non-invasively, I mean those existed methods. They are either used, uh, I mentioned the uh, electro recording, mm -hmm. you will poke the cell, mm -hmm. the damage the cell body, the membrane integrity, mm -hmm. and all, yeah, so basically that's the traditional way, mm -hmm. or you inject dye, mm -hmm. which also uh, damage the cell. Mm -hmm. So we, we, want, we don't want to damage the cell, we want to remain the cell itself complete there, yes. and uh, so imaging is a very good method, you, you, light is relatively non-invasive, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so the idea was use a imaging way to image yeah to get signals from uh, gap junctional communication. Mm. So um, how how do we create the signal? Mm. So we came up the basic principle based on the uh, this a channel gap junction is a channel. So. <laughs> this is so mind blowing. Keep going. Yes. <laughs> Are you still there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm just with jaw dropped, just trying to compute all of the information. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. So it's ba based on the. Uh, it's a channel between cells. So we want to. We want in the one cell. We want to generate a specific small molecule as a mediator. And in the other cell, the, the mediator will go through the gap junction. And the, mm. in the connected cell, there's a sensor for the small mediator. Mm. So once we trigger one cell, mm -hmm. there's a response in the other cell. Then this demonstrates that these two cells are communicated by gap junctions. That's the basic idea. So there's a... So, so Paris has to have uh, one s on the on the presynaptic has to have an actuator. Yeah, the and, actuator. And on the postsynaptic has to have a reader. Yeah, a sensor. A, reader. a sensor, a reader, mm -hmm. and then you when you see electro activity. This actuator can be controlled. It can be controlled. Yeah. Okay. If we activate the actuator, it will generate. Via like my smartphone or like how do I, you know, how do you, <laughs> how do you like click a button and like you, the neuron activate, how do you do that? How do you do that first part? I don't know whether you have heard of optogenetics. Optogenetics. So through light. 
through light. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Use light to stimulate it, stimulate the actuator, and uh, the actuator actually is a proton pump. It's a proton pump. Okay. Light sensitive proton pump. Okay, okay. So basically, you are using the proton as a signal. As an actuator. Uh, as the mediator. As the mediator. The proton's the mediator. Yeah. Kay. You activate the actuator by the light. By the it light. It will Kay. give you the mediator, which is proton. Which is proton. Kay. And the proton can readily go through the channel. Yes. Okay. And the, the connected cell, there is a sensor for proton. For, for proton. Yeah. And then that sensor, you read out the data from that sensor, v how do you read out the data from that sensor that the proton around? Yeah, that's a fluorescent protein. A fluorescent it will protein. emit fluorescence, which can be collected by the microscopy. Okay, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so you're literally stimulating with optogenetic on one side, and then you're, you're cascading a, a proton to go across to the other cell that then is read out through microscopy by fluorescence yeah. on this other side. And then you know that the proton successfully made it across, which means this is an electrical synapse and these two neurons are talking to each other. Yeah. And that's how you know, aha, a little bit of knowledge about neural communication. Yeah, like you wonder what types are communicated by gap junctions, you can put the actuator in one type of cell, the uh, sensor in another type of cell, and uh, stimulate one cell and uh, image the other cell. Wow. That's, a, that's the idea. Yeah. And we tried it and it worked as we expected. Nice, yeah. That's always nice as a scientist. <laughs> Let's set up this experiment. We think it's going to work, and then you do it, and it works. And you can repeat it, and you can get papers published, and hopefully other scientists can use it, use it, and build on it. And then, yeah. then we know the chemoconnectomics better. And then in this case, it would be the electroconnectomics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or you can add them both. Chemoelectroconnectomics <laughs> <laughs> or electrochemoconnectomics. It's so funny. The words are so good. Um, but they're all encompassing, which I like about it. And in this case, it's literal, literally you're only doing one to one neuron, but down the line, you can possibly do maybe a hundred at the same time to try and see like big picture, more big picture uh, neural communication. That's one of the goals, is that right? More big picture neural communication. Yeah, we, the fact is that we, we don't, for now we don't know yet w which type of neurons, because there are so many neurons in the brain, which of them are talking through gap junctions, we don't actually know as a, as a whole picture. We know some, but that's only a very small part of it. And how, how it, being regulated, how it contributes to uh, chemical synapses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I asked you that at the beginning and that's a really interesting point is just what is the deal with electrical synapses versus ones that are neurochemical versus ones that are both neurochemical and electrical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so much information in this conversation which has been so interesting. Yeah, okay, continue. You're, you're about to say something. So, so for now we know that the main function for electrical synapses is uh, synchronized neurons firing. Like those oh, yeah, neurons are connected by gap junctions, they will fire together. So they will release transmitters together. Electrical gap. synapses are used to synchronize 
in many ways, neuron, neuronal communication, synchronized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's yeah. one of the function. One of the functions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the others is like it because it can also. Um, I have a question. So. So would it be like, if I'm taking in some sort of a stimuli that is maybe becoming more more frequent in my life maybe it's like i'm going on like the same route to school or maybe it's i'm eating the same food or drinking the same water or talking to the same person or hearing the same thing or seeing the same thing that would it then be that that those that, that neural communication is synchronizing through gap junctions to make it a little bit more efficient because I'm taking in the same stimuli? A, I think that's a little bit different. Yeah, that might so, be a little yeah, 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 So yeah. by repeated s stimuli, you probably are strengthen are strengthening the connection between neurons. As some, as you're constantly stimulating the same circuits. Yes. So they, those neurons were not as connected as uh, at the beginning, but you keep uh, stimulating them at the same time, so they become more s connected. So, yeah. that. Yeah, what, what would be an example of uh, neural synchrony then f with gap junctions? Like why? What, what outside stimuli in the environment would cause neural synchrony for me through the gap junctions? It's a constantly open channel, so it happens uh, almost all the time. Like those neurons have gap junctions, they will fire together. They any stimuli can stimulate this neuron, they, they will fire together. It's, it's constantly open there, so it mm, <laughs> connected a bunch of neurons. For example, in the cortex, the interneurons, the interneurons are uh, abundantly connected with uh, gap junctions. The interneurons function is to uh, modulate the primary neuron, which are the real um, executor to, to do the job to control your behavior. So if, but interneurons can um, connect with, uh, can regulate the activity of the primary neuron. So then those interneurons are connected by gap junctions yeah. So they can fire together, so they can regulate a bunch of primary neuron together. So... Mm. How do you know what's a primary neuron versus a connector neuron? Does the primary it, neuron start the, the signal transmission? Primary neuron have long synapses. Have long synapses. Yeah, they have long projection synapses. Oh, long projection synapses. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And connectors long. have s shorter. Interneurons. Yeah. Interneurons. Interneurons, they 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 look different morphologically. They are different. Primary neuron have this long axon, and. Uh, mm, throughout different uh, layers of cortex. <laughs> okay, pri pr primary neurons have a longer axon and a longer synapse, and uh, interneurons. So pr pr yes. um, primary neurons are the neurons who do who does the job to control behavior because they connect, they, they have this projection, uh, projected axons to control other um, neurons, to control motor neurons. Okay, yeah. 
motor neurons to yeah. control behavior, yeah. but its activity are regulated by interneurons. Yes. Our primary neurons primarily located in the cortex and in the, like especially the prefrontal cortex or what? All, the All over the cortex. Cortex, yeah. Okay. And then their long axons go to interneurons, which are then in lower, more like limbic structures. They they project to um, they control. They it's very complicated. <laughs> so um, they don't project to interneurons. They project to other primary neurons. Primary talk to other. Oh, the, the limbic talks to other primary. Where were yeah? Where were we on that point again? <laughs> I was thinking about the cyclical potential, but I, I know. I know, I know you you were, you're trying to make me come up with some uh, examples about gap junctions function, right? Yeah, and you were talking about like the inter neurons have smaller in gap Small, junctions. Smaller. And they they don't have uh, projection. Axons. They don't have. They don't have projection axons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interneurons don't have projection axons. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. Okay. If you if you see a typical picture of a cortex, the six layer of cortex, um, the primary neuron can uh, go through all the layers, but interneurons can stay in the ones with one different, there are many different types of interneurons in different layers, yeah. But the primary neurons span all the layers. Oh my gosh. Even this, like, the, even understanding like how, what a primary neuron does compared to an interneuron is so interesting. Okay, uh, for another conversation. Okay, so um, to the applications, let's talk about of Paris. Okay, so what happens when you uh, are using this optogenetically stimulated proton pump and then reading out the via fluorescence? That sounds really cool, but like, what can it be, you know, applied for? So in the paper, we, we showed an application is to map the real location of electrical synapses. As I mentioned, neurons have uh, complex morphology, the, their axons and uh, dendrites, but in the um, subcellular level, where does the electrical synapses, where does this channels localized on the cell is hard to study by other methods. So their cells, their cell body, they have a bunch of processes. They can overlap, they can overlap with each other through at a different site of those processes or between cell body contacts. So how do we locate them? locate the channel. Using this um, Paris method, you can control the light. You can spot the light at different sites locally to induce the signal and to see where the channel is. If mm -hmm. you spot the light, activate the channel on the dendrites, and it gives you a signal. But if you stop the, uh, stimulate the light, um, the, the actuator on the axons, you don't observe a signal. That might indicate that those two cells communicate through uh, dendritic dendritic interaction. That's one example for the application. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we have uh, spatial resolution and the localization of the channel in different sides of the cell might, might indicate something. 
for, for how this turnaround can um, communicate more efficiently. And uh, yeah, we, we, we don't actually know. Such as if the, um, if the channel is localized on the axon, it might more, um, be more efficiently to um, uh, propagate the, to, to make the, the uh, cell more uh, easy to fire easier to fire together, yeah. So basically they have spatial resolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, for other um, application examples, I can come up like uh, for uh, drug screening. Gap junction not only exists in the brain, actually, it also exists abundantly in the heart. Mm -hmm. So that synchronizes the firing of heart muscle, making uh, your heart contract. Yeah. So the, mm, the uh, gap junction blocker, um, so it's um, used as a drug to protect heart from um, infarct, mm -hmm. ischemia. Mm -hmm. So we can use the, the, this method to screen more drugs that otherwise um, block gap junction communication or regulate gap junction communication. Yeah, can do this in vitro screening. Mm. Okay, so you have pharmacological applications, also just uh, larger uh, uh, neural mapping and communicative uh, of applications. Okay, okay. Because um, I can again get lost in all of the weeds of what you were just talking about, where there's so much nuance, um, but that's, um, we can maybe yeah even get into a, another uh, part of this of 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 a deeper dive into the brain science um, with you on all of these applications at a, another time because I just know that this is like way more nuanced. Like you were talking about ions earlier, right? I have no idea that ions were even a part of the brain neural communicative process. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that ions are a part of it, that there's primary neurons and inter neurons that, that there's I should just come electrical. up with better <laughs> examples. <laughs> well, th th this is also, you're, you're trying to teach about the edge of complexity to, to a big, uh, we're trying to bring that down, like explain like I'm five to, to to me and to other people and, and it's very it's a very hard one to do like electrical synapses versus um, traditional synapses with neurochemistry versus just um, electricity okay so what are the the applications for health and disease of this are mostly like you were saying of just having a better idea of mapping out neurocommunicative infrastructure plus pharmacological understanding is like what where would you see like the most ideal applications of this technology in health in health yeah there are some disease diseases um, caused by the mutation of channel protein though one of them is called ODDD. It's a, um, I didn't remember the complete name, mm -hmm. but it's a developmental disease. So the uh, patient will suffer from abnormal development of their uh, digitals, like fingers, toes, and teeth. And the, yeah, the, they, their higher cognitive function also um, uh, 
infected and not abnormal. And it's caused by the, a bunch of mutations on the, on the uh, protein, one type of the channel protein connecting 43. So, you're asking about health. Health. Yeah. So, how, how this um, method can help with health. I think we can um, use this method to um, a study of the diseases caused by the mutations of the um, junction channels. Interesting. Diseases caused by mutations of the junction channels. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So there's mutations that happen at gap junction channels, yeah. and those mutations cause diseases. Okay, okay, okay. Now I'm following. Okay. And so, yeah, we can prevent those diseases by studying how those uh, mutations happen at gap junction channels and either prevent them from happening or heal them. Maybe and at the uh, mechanism level, how how those mutations affect gap junction communications? Whether this mutation uh, caused disease by the abnormal by altering the gap junction communication? Yeah, because. It seems like so many of our diseases are related to miscommunications. And so if there's a miscommunication happening at that gap junction, then it may be a leading to a serious disease. Yeah. Because some, some mutations might, um, might uh, some mutations might affect the communication, but some are, may not. So, it's, so what indeed they mutation contributes the uh, disease and it happens in a channel protein. So it's, it would be um, useful to test that, to test the uh, results, consequence of the mutation. Mm -hmm. How about um, on a And then t con continuing our conversation about uh, other diseased states of the brain and how those are issues of miscommunication or other uh, neural communication just issues in general. Um, where do you see all of the neurological diseases that we pick up. And I mean, neurodegeneration happens usually at end of life, but we're talking like 10 year old, 20 year old, 30 year old, like really young people are experiencing anxiety, depression, OCD, ADHD, blah, 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 blah. They're like endless, all of the issues. What do you, what do you, what insights do you have about the development of those? And uh, why do you think they're happening and how do you think we can heal them? That's a very big issue. And uh, we don't have a clear answer what exactly happened in the brain having those psychiatry disease now. But something we knew is that for those brains, so um, so it's mainly happened like two levels. One is the molecular level, the other is the circuit level. So for the molecular level, it's like they we we know that the uh, low level of dopamine, low level of uh, serotonin is, associ is uh, associated with 
um, diseases such as um, depression. Um, so that's um, that's a that's a molecular level, and on the circuit level is. Um, it's the connection between neurons. There's something wrong with the connections. Either the region that controls the um, negative emotion, the connection are strong, strong, strengthened, or the connection with the um, region. Positive is too weak? Yeah. It can, yeah. So molecularly, the issue is about low levels of serotonin or dopamine. And circuitry, it's either n negative circuitry is too strong or positive circuitry is too weak. That's mine. Understanding. Uh, it's your understanding, yeah. I like that understanding a lot, yeah. Yeah, like if someone's like hyper OCD, it might be like I've had like several times where I've seen like these two, there's like two hairs on the table over mm -hmm. here and I've been like, well, maybe I should just like brush them off like mm -hmm. that. You know, like what's going on in my brain that's, that's so strongly wired that I must go and do that? Uh, or is it, you know, too weak of wiring about like retaining or paying attention here or whatever it may be, or too strong of wiring of paying attention to all these other aspects of the environment or whatever, whatever it is. Hmm. Depression especially and has a lot to do with Societally, like sociologically, has a lot to do with being at the bottom levels of hierarchies. Like people at low levels in hierarchies that don't have shelter, don't have water, don't have food, that are constantly struggling to get by, are is just harder for them to have high levels of happiness and low levels of depression. But there's a weird scenario where there's people around the world that have none of that stuff, but they're also really happy. Yeah. Which is very strange, because then you wonder, well, what are the, the chemokinectomics of their brain where they're totally happy when they have nothing, but then these people have nothing, but they're totally unhappy. How is that happening? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And... Uh, it, it, which reminds me of that uh, um, people, when people do uh, the research on mice, they will they will uh, use some way to make the mice stress, and they will always found that some of group of ma uh, some mice will be depressed, and the other mice will be resilient. Yeah. So there has to be something about the uh, innate state of the brain. That's pretty interesting too. It's like how, that could be an interesting question for chemokinectomics or just uh, circuitry strengthening or weakening in terms of just how, how someone is resilient to stress compared to others, and does that have something to do with epigenetics? Does that have something to do with ancestral genetics leading up to yeah, this point? Yeah, there are a lot. One way to study this is, um, or powerful tool to study this is uh, single cell RNA seq. Single cell RNA se se sequencing. sequencing. Yeah. Why? Why is single cell RNA sequencing so useful? Because it at the it looks at the transcription to, uh, transcription level. Mm -hmm. What what protein 
has a different expression level, like what um, so people can compare the mice with higher resilience and the uh, high mice mm. with a um, sesquipedity. By sequencing the RNA, you can see what a genetic difference is between high resilience mice versus low resilience mice to stress. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Damn, RNA is so interesting. Yeah, RNA sequencing can give us uh, phenotypic, phenotypic, phenotypal data. Yeah, can can give you more. Uh, but we don't know. Maybe you we will ha you will find out a bunch of genes, a lot of genes. So, so yeah, you, by combining with other methods and uh, uh, things we already know, it can provide you some candidate at the molecular level to yeah. study to go further. <laughs> Wow. Okay. I'm also really interested in how, on the flip side of what we were talking about sociologically, there's lots of rich people that are high up on hierarchies that have high serotonin levels that don't experience depression. And there are also lots of rich people at the top of hierarchies that have low levels of serotonin that have high levels of depression, which is like the opposite of what, it's the same thing we were talking about about the bottom but it's the opposite in terms of people at the top having a similar effect. So there's a lot of interesting things sociologically and then molecularly in circuitry. Oh man, gotta love complexity, gotta love complexity. It's a lot to understand scientifically, a lot to probe and try and like weigh variables and understand the nuance of these things. How about What would be your ideal neuroscience tool? What would give you ultimate power in understanding the brain? So I think there are um, three aspects we need to consider. One is how, how neurons connect it, the connectome. Of, of course, it's very important. And the other thing is um, we, we need to perturb a single, at the single neuron level to see. So at the first level, we need a connectome, we need a circuit, we, need, we, we, know, we know the circuits, we already know um, the, the neurons how it connects. And the second step, we need to perturb, perturb it at a single cell level, either by, um, so now we have the um, optogenetic methods or uh, other methods, ke uh, chemogenetic methods to perturb it. And when we ter perturb it, we, we can know something about its function. The third thing is um, molecular level. You control the different protein molecules in the neuron. So you, like in uh, pathologic con condition, you already this know that, for example, you already know this neuron activity is changed. But what caused it? What's a molecular target basis? So you need to have the third strategy to um, control, perturb the uh, protein at the protein level, yeah, molecular level. So combine those thing, different levels, I think, can mm, mm, more comprehensively for us to understand how the brain functions. 
I like that. I wonder how that would be packaged in a, like a two in like one tool that could do connectomics, perturbation, and molecular level. You can't. I don't think you, you can. can. It's all possible. <laughs> Everything is possible. <laughs> we have to just design it. We have to design it. It's possible. We have to design it. I, and also, I, as I mentioned, the single RNA seq is a very powerful level. I just think one database, one comprehensive database about you uh, incorporate all the information we have, like the connectomics information, con uh, connectome information, and uh, a single RNA seq information, and their. Um, the, the behavior, related to the behavior and the disease, the mutations, if we have all the information um, at a single neuron level and uh, at, the, at the same database, like we can, we have a mouse brain, we can click mm -hmm. one neuron, then we can see the cell connected to which cell and where it locates, and we can also see this the the epi, uh, the genomic of the cell, uh, the transcriptome of the cell yeah and uh, um, what what have been done related to the uh, behavior uh, yes results that would be useful yes that to me that sounds like a big simulation model of okay. your brain and me being able to like click in and look through but I would also have to have like a history of your life experiences that have caused your brain to become exactly what it is today and like <laughs> yeah it's all I want to build a digital twin of you and me of everyone <laughs> let's build which is where we're heading in many ways um, what about how can we inspire more people around the world to work together because here we are in China doing these partnership interviews here you are about to do your postdoc in the United States. People around the world to go to other countries around the world and make friends and make relationships is very important. Yeah. How can we better work together? How can we better work together? Uh, I think it's for for the PI in the lab, the group leader in the lab, they they should encourage students more to um, attend more um, conferences and uh, uh, talk to people from different. Um, go more to the uh, like happy hour and uh, encourage them to um, join attend those events, activities, mm, and give them um, opportunities to present their work more often. Mm. Yeah, I like that a lot. Okay, and then what do you think is a skill that young people should develop as we move into the exponential technology age? Coding. <laughs> Why? Why do you say that? Because it's really powerful and uh, it can make uh, boring stuff uh, take less time from you. Mm. I don't know. I feel like uh, everybody can code <laughs> if 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 you don't know how to code, you you spend mm, more time on boring stuff, and uh, um, you'll be less efficient. Coding is also a way of perceiving the world in algorithms or in loops. There's so many. Yeah, you can train your logic. 
train your logic really well. Yeah. 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 What do you think is the meaning of life? That's a really big question. I think the meaning of life is is to make any contributions you can. I like that. It's good. What about where do you think consciousness originates from? <laughs> Consciousness. So, seems like basically consciousness. Consciousness is the activity of neuron. You think it comes from the biology of our body, that it doesn't come from somewhere beyond. The body. No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, what about um, what do you think is the relationship between free will and determinism? So you mean, do we have free will? What do you think? I think we do. Why do you think so? Why don't we? Well, Why do you think we have free will? Why don't we have free will? <laughs> but like, I mean, can you give me some examples? Like sure. People I think they don't have, they don't think we have free will. Well. Okay, I was telling you a little bit about this before the show started. There's examples of people that have had a tumor pressing against their amygdala and they went out and killed people, their own family members. Okay? There's other examples of people being able to look back at your behaviors over millions of years, the evolution of human behavior, the evolution of microbes over billions of years before us that are now housed inside of our guts that are very much in control of what our actions. Do you think it's you going to the refrigerator to get food or do you think it's your microbes telling you to go to the fridge to get food? If if it's a micro if it's a microbe in your gut to tell you to get the food. It's still you. Where is you? Where is you? Where is me? Is it in my brain, in my heart, in my gut? Is it in my body? Or is there no me? Is there no you? Is this physical boundary of our skin not actually a Where real boundary, but we're really all interconnected at a way deeper level than what looks like physical difference. Uh, I've thought about this question. Do we have free will? But I still think we have. Mm. So I, it's like uh, your your will is still in you, and.
the things you've been through makes who you are. Mm. The the example you raise, like uh, the 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 their patient have a tumor on their middle of the will go kill people, doesn't mean they don't have free will. Well, if they would have had free will, wouldn't have they been able to make the decisions them themselves to not kill their family? So in that case, it's a biology that has created something like a tumor that is pressing against my amygdala, causing me to go do something. Just like biology, like the microbes in your gut, causing you to go and get food. Just like, what is you? Is you your prefrontal cortex? Is you your brain or your heart or your gut? Where is you? Is you in this body? Is you outside of this body? Do you have a relationship with, your, with a higher self? Because these questions are, crucial they're critical questions because many people are overly wrapped in their egos and it doesn't give us greater collaborative potential when we're too wrapped up in our own egos looping us back all the way to what you said at the very beginning about selfishness i don't know i think it's kind of intermediate we we kind of have free will but we also kind of don't have it <laughs> fair fair okay <laughs> what is the role of love in life it's very important tell me about why you say that What is the role of love? Love So like for example for uh, the, the being reports babies born with less uh, parental caring yeah. will be more uh, they will uh, feel more insecure when they grow up yes so love is important as the beginning of your life yes you if we all live in a life in an environment with a lot of love it will help you become also a person feel more mm, confident inside you have more strength inside yourself which will make you more willing to give love to others yeah yeah, yeah. <sighs> and if we could all work on that love within ourselves that we can then also give to others then our world a lot of those problems we were initially mentioning at the beginning just take care of themselves better Last question, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? I think, in my opinion, is the ocean. <laughs> Why? It's, um, I'm looking for a word. <laughs> it's endless. It's, um, mysterious and it's powerful and every time I look at the ocean I am standing by side the uh, beach looking at the ocean I will feel feel calm I'm, I'm a big fan of diving yeah <laughs> yes. I every time I go under the water I, I can feel calm more yeah. calm and uh, it's just amazing. The underwater, the, those animals living there are amazing. And mm -hmm. plants, corals, and we yeah we need to uh, 
pay more attention about protect our <laughs> ocean. Yeah. What a beautiful answer. <laughs> this has been such a fun episode, Ling. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you. Thank you. It's been such an honor. This is so fun. <laughs> so mind-blowing across so many different aspects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about neural communication in general. The conversations we're having about electrical synapses, about the chemo electroconnectomics, about all this crazy stuff and what it means for our future, for our health, for our longevity. Have more conversations about building better tools to study the brain and sharing those around the world. Also check out the link in the bio below to more of Ling's work and to yulonglilab.org. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below. Help us continue doing cool things like coming on site to China for more continued partnership interviews. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. And we will see you soon. Peace. <laughs>